Hello, I am Brett. This is my channel. You are watching live, hopefully. Uh, if not, this is something I do every Thursday for years now, and you can come back reliably on Thursdays. Check out what we're talking about in container land and DevOps land, all things Docker, Kubernetes, CNCF, all those buzzwords. And I sometimes have guests. In fact, quite often I have guests. So the reason we do this live is so that you can be involved and ask questions. And this is audience participation time. So thanks for being here. And thanks to my patrons. So this is a member supported show uh, from all of you fantastic people that sponsor it. Thank you so much. We have a little bit over 100 people uh, financially support buying me a coffee every month, me and the team. Where there's a, a group of people that help me pull this off. And you can sign up down here. You don't have to actually give me any money if you don't want to, totally fine. You just click the join button, or actually it's follow button, and you get an, uh, about a weekly email that is about all the open source I'm creating, all the content, who's gonna be on the show, what, what guest is on the podcast. So if you didn't know, this show turns into a podcast. And we strip out the, the visual bits, the part about demos, which we're gonna be doing a lot of demos today and talking about Docker Desktop on Linux. So you can see that in audio format in the future on the podcast, all the links are below. You can join the Discord server. We just hit 10,000 members on my DevOps Discord server. So yay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so if you if you like Discord, it's one of my favorite chat clients. Uh, it's great for community. You can, you can join that above. And we just hang out and talk about DevOps stuff there. Every month, in fact, just yesterday, we do a little, uh, basically it's like a hangout. We jump into a video channel inside our Discord server. It's just a bunch of DevOps professionals talking about projects they're working on. People bring code, or they usually bring infrastructure as code, and we, we review it. We might talk about your Docker files or give you help on Kubernetes, Helm Manifest or something. Uh, you never know. So uh, if you do, if you want to do that, you just join up for the High Fivers group, and then uh, you see an email about once a month that we join. Uh, so it's a great, fun time. All right, let's get to it. Thank you so much. Uh, for my guests on the show today, I'm very excited to have Docker back on the show. We've got there in the middle, Anka Yordake, I'm going to get that right. Um, uh, and then we've got on the next to her, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being here, you two. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And Dave's been around a while. He's a staff software engineer. We actually were just talking. He came apart. He, he became part of Docker around the time of the Unikernel acquisition, which if y'all don't remember, years ago, Docker actually, I think, was that focused on Docker Desktop? Like, that was that what it was about, the Unikernel? Docker Desktop kind of happened as a sort of an offshoot of it. We um, okay. used the Unikernel technology. So like we had a bunch of uh, really good libraries and components, and uh, we realized there was a really good use for it in Docker Desktop, and that's kind of how it all started. Okay, yeah, because I assume, I feel like I remember something about the networking bits being a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, originally. that's true. That's true. So we had a lot of lot of uh, people in difficult network environments where they had to use uh, VPNs, and then the traffic would get blocked because it, the VPN policy would say things like, "Oh yeah, it must have yeah. must come from localhost." So we had to launder all the traffic through localhost, and so we needed like a TCP stack. Oh, and, oh, actually, we had a TCP stack. Here it is. Unikernel had a TCP stack, so we just stick it in there, run it in reverse, yeah. and then magic happens. Yeah, we just had this thing laying around. You might, you might want to try it. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Uh, and Anka, uh, how did you get to Docker? Well, I joined two and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I've been working before mostly on the VM um, technologies, so containers or something new. So what's the best place to learn about container technologies is to join Docker. Yeah, and might really, as well work there. It's been an amazing kind of period trip, at least from a learning perspective. So, <laughs> very cool. Did you join? Did you know that you were going to be working on Docker Desktop when you joined, or did you have an idea of your uh, role? Uh, well, at the beginning, I uh, when I joined, I started to work more on the open source uh, tools. Mm. So I worked for a while on <laughs> Docker Compose, <laughs> right, and some other uh, CLI plugins, but all related to Compose. Uh, I worked on the, um, the ECS uh, functionality, so basically the cloud capability um, uh, for Compose, where we want yep. to be able to launch Compose applications on ECS and ACI. I was mostly involved uh, in the ECS part. Um, and then I, uh, I switched teams. From time to time, we reorganize a bit the engineering groups they, uh, group based on interest. 
Right. So um, I thought I will have a lot of things to learn on the desktop side, especially I, I, uh, most of the time I was more on the high level uh, part mm -hmm. uh, components. So I would like to uh, dive a bit deeper and learn uh, more what it what is happening on the lower level. It's really right. uh, it helps me with debugging uh, when I understand what is happening at the lower level. So right. uh, I've been working now for almost a year on desktop. Very cool. So we, <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I remember, I think the way we met was we were at DockerCon and you were, I think, on this stream, if I remember correctly, doing a uh, ECS demo uh, with Compose. I, that's at least uh, my memory. Yeah. It was actually the ACI, ACI one. And then oh, we, okay. I think we started to create, to work on Compose V2. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, and I'm a big fan of Compose on this show. So we, we have like a semi-annual uh, Compose show where I just I rant on about all the Compose features. So if those of you have missed it, uh, Compose Compose V2 is pretty cool. You should definitely check it out. I I don't think there's a day every week that I don't use it. Like it's just a standard tool in my toolbox. It's my favorite uh, dev tool. Not that I'm biased, but I may be. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. before, actu before actually getting to, to work on this, I was, I many, many years ago, I used to uh, script everything, to write bash scripts, and then they, it was a, a headache just to maintain those scripts to be able yeah. to deploy some stuff. And now I, I don't need to do that anymore. I just need a compose file. So that's why it's my favorite one. Yeah. And, that, and, there you're never done with the bash stuff like the you're going to end up eventually rewriting compose and bash if you keep adding functionality to your dev tools uh that's the problem <laughs> with being a developer is that you it, there's always a point in your career where you start writing your own tools and then there's that point where you realize you don't got time to write your own tools <laughs> yeah so the problem was we were wasting a lot of time just maintaining some custom scripts or yeah. custom deployment tools instead of focusing on, on the actual task we had to do. Right, right. We, at some so. point, we all got to get to work. So, um, well, thank you so much for being here, both of you. I am excited to talk about this. So we actually had a question before we even started the show, which was, why does, basically, why does Docker Desktop for Linux now exist? Which is sort of, this is the celebration show I'm having, is like, it exists. Yay, let's talk about it. Um, Dave, do you want to handle that one? Like... Yeah, yeah. So I think um, it's a, it's a very good question because, of course, uh, Docker starts as a as a Linux tool. Uh, the Docker engine uh, is a Linux Linux component, and it's of course spawned lots of really great stuff. And it's spawned you know con uh, ContainerD and it's spawned uh, specs like OCI and Registry. And then we uh, we created Docker Desktop uh, for Mac and Windows to bring it to Mac and Windows. But then we also added lots of extra things, uh, valuable tools, um, uh, good defaults, lots of nice new features, which will you'll see some of and uh, so these these features we want to bring to Linux developers as well uh, so it's like it's like a homecoming for us really because like we started on Linux went off on a on a journey around Mac and Windows and now we're back to Linux again hopefully full circle that's a, that's actually a pretty good story I like that um, yeah because there are I mean <laughs> I have to throw into the show is this the year of Linux on the desktop because <laughs> you knew it was coming like I was gonna have to say that um, but we, we all, I think a lot of us is, that are huge Linux fans, there's a, always a journey. I think everyone is sort of like a rite of passage to decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try using Linux as my main desktop machine. And obviously it's probably, I, th I think it's the most challenging OS simply because there's not one huge giant company, uh, that's a juggernaut all constantly adding features. It's sort of a collaborative effort from thousands and thousands of people. Pro it's amazing. It's, it's hard to imagine like tens of thousands of people randomly around the world that are writing the code on your desktop that's not related to any one particular company. But that that's kind of what the experience is. I, I'm old, so I started with like FreeBSD and, you know, old old days back in Linux kernel, like Linux 2 kernel days. Um, and those were the days that I remember having all the fun, figuring out how Wi-Fi drivers work in the 90s because it wasn't really a thing. And um, and fast forward 20 years, basically, and here we are, uh, essentially, I, I've lost count of the number of friends that their main machine is a Linux desktop. And, you know, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's more than it used to be. 
let's say that. So it sounds like this is a roadmap thing. Like you, you all wanted it, but you needed proof from the community that they actually needed it or really wanted it. Is that, is that kind of how it went down? I would say so, yeah, because I think uh, uh, we're all very big Linux fans, so we'd, <laughs> we'd love to do this kind of thing. But obviously, uh, we want to work on things that our you know, users find most useful. So yeah, the roadmap was where it all happened on uh, github.com slash docker slash roadmap. Yes, and I, wanted to, I definitely wanted to point that out because you know I don't think we could mention the roadmap too much. Uh, but it exists. Uh, actually, I'm a little zoomed in here. But um, I will put this... I'm going to put this in chat so we can all look. Everybody can check it out. So this is where, I, when I have an idea for Docker and I want them to make it, uh, this is where I go. And, you know, they obviously evaluate uh, all the stuff based on thumbs upping things. So I'm selfish. And sometimes when I have an idea, I will put it on this show to ask everyone on the show who's attending to go thumbs up my ideas. So uh, Linux for the Linux for the desktop was... Was it one of the most popular? I, th I feel like there was like it was like top five or something. Is that true? Um, I think it was. I can't remember where it was in the top five, but I think that was definitely it's maybe top three, maybe even. Yeah, it had. Uh, it's got two hundred eighty-one thumbs up on the main issue, and probably a whole lot of uh, people in 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 here talking about why they want it. Yeah, it's just a it's a t standard long thread on GitHub of everyone wishing that it was existed, and now it does. So yay, team! <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about it. I mean, obviously, uh, not to not to like uh, bury the lead, but everyone, if you if you have a Linux desktop, you can go download it. It's in the docs. Uh, it's available. The link is in the description below. Like, it, it, it's been out for what a couple months, I think, as a beta. Yeah, I, I uh, yes, I think so. Anka, you're the expert, though. I'll defer to you. Yeah, sorry. So. Uh, it's a beta version. Uh, so far, we only have a dev package because uh, we are testing it uh, on Ubuntu and Debian at the moment. But we are going to prepare some additional packages for other distros. The idea was we would like at least to have uh, a more targeted uh, distros to be able to identify quickly what are the, let's say, the bugs or uh, what we can quickly fix. Right. And yeah. Then, instead of instead of worrying all on the d deployment tooling, you're focused on the product itself right now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, but so we are going to prepare some new uh, packages soon. But for now, uh, we have uh, we support on mostly the latest versions of uh, Ubuntu and Debian. Well, there is also the the fact that we rely on quite uh, new technologies for for it. So basically, uh, we have decided to keep the same architecture uh, that we have on Mac and Windows. So we are going to run the Docker engine inside the VM. There are several benefits for that. Uh, it gives us several benefits. First one and the most one of the most important that we want to focus on is uh, security. So the additional uh, layer of security that uh, the VM offers. Basically, we can run. I mean, I don't remember if uh, I've ever really paid attention to the images that I'm running that I'm using to run containers. So a lot right. of uh, a lot of times we may just go uh, look search on the internet something, uh, just copy paste uh, and run a Docker run command, and just uh, execute it without even checking what that image uh, contains. Right. So right now with the VM, uh, it's kind of it offers you that security layer if you're running malicious software, and there is a privilege escalation. It's just the VM, so it's still it. The host is not uh, affected, right? So uh, we can simply get rid of the VM disk and just reboot. We're back in business. Uh, yeah, so that that's that's a common question. I imagine that's probably in the FAQ somewhere that this this just like Mac and Windows, this runs in a in a VM. It's because we've all, as Linux people, we've all had the daemon in the in running on the host os this whole time so if people needed that uh they already have it so that, that it, 
it was an interesting discussion because I remember when you came to the captains and were asking us around, like, how would we like to run it? And there was some sort of input we had initially. And I have no idea if that affected anything. But I, I think at first it seemed it initially seemed weird that it was going to be in a VM when it's it could be just straight native on the OS. But then that you're you and the team came back and kind of gave us the explanation and I was totally on board with that. That t- to me that made complete sense. Yeah, make it identical experience of Mac and Windows, tiny little VM and I can blow it away, I can reset it. You can you don't have to worry about versions cuz you control all that and and I get it. Like that's a uh, that's a that's a probably a reason I will have to be explaining pe- to people in my courses and, and in the future because they will say, "Well, why why don't why isn't just a GUI on top of the, the host OS?" And then we just sort of get on that road of you know, let's, you can already do that. And, and that's actually something you're probably going to demo today, right? Is like the ability to use both and switch back and forth or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there are several advantages, not only that the security one, um, well, it gives us some flexibility in terms of deploying on different distros because we don't have to worry of what of the configuration of the host. So we have a very small set of dependencies and that makes it easy it makes it uh, easier to port to to other distros. So basically, all we need to do is to be able to uh, launch a VM, right. a TMU VM. And uh, basically, we don't need root, ac- root access. O- of course, it's just you install it as root, but then to launch, it's just uh, as a normal user. Right. Oh, that's a good point. So yeah. uh, that, and that, I think you kind of all, answered the Owen's question around, do you need systemd operating systems to use this? And you're really just saying like right now, that's the thing you're, you're focused on that during the beta. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have integration with system to, to, uh, to be able to enable uh, Docker desktop to start up um, in case you want on login or yeah. So is there a roadmap here that you can talk about in terms of something other than Ubuntu and Debian? Uh, at the moment, we are preparing an RPM package. Okay. Uh, we are testing it on several uh, distros. We need to check also the integration with uh, KD. So far, we've tested on GNOME Desktop. Uh, it seems to be OK. It picks up all the files correctly. So we can get a nice uh, shiny icon and uh, the system tray. Uh, uh, okay. But we, we are still testing on uh, RPM-based uh, systems. And once we are pretty sure it works fine, we can uh, actually update the page with an, a link to RPM, uh, to the RPM package. We also plan uh, to add all these packages to our uh, apt and RPM repositories, such that you don't need to download uh, them manually. With, so you, oh, can, interesting. you should be able just to do an app, get installed Docker desktop. As long as you have the dev repository, the Docker dev repository set up. Right. So it's it would be the same repository as you would for the the, the engine on the host, right? Yeah. Which yeah. probably most people, if they're running Docker desktop on their Linux machines, they probably are using that, not the, not the host uh, operating system apt package, which is probably like... I don't know, Docker 13 or something at this point. Yeah, that, that will be a kind of, we are defining that as a conflict to make sure we have all the right packages to, to be able to run. So Yeah. So for those of you out there, if you follow the instructions on Docker Docs, like you'll be fine because that, that's one yeah. of the first, that's one of the first questions that people often get in my courses is, you know, they're, they're like, I'm on this old version. And I don't understand why. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably using the wrong package. Like don't just and, use, yeah. And please don't, uh don't jump directly to step two go to step one because i had cases when people said okay it can't find i'm doing an app to get installed it can't find the dependency which is the docker cli defined in our repository well go to back to step one <laughs> yeah so... set up docker repository yep <laughs> yeah okay so it's just the standard li- yeah the linux repository that yeah. is the so depending on the system, the, the operating system that you use, you have, uh, it's everything documented how to set up the repositories. That's pretty interesting. So is so the Docker desktop itself doesn't have a dependency on the host engine, right? You can install this without installing the host engine? Uh, it runs in parallel. It doesn't, right. uh, it has no conflict with it. 
Okay. So that's so, it's also an advantage in the way that you can switch with the CLI uh, with the context. Uh, you can switch to use whichever you want. As long cool. as you are using the right context, you can target both in even in the same time if you run Docker commands and you specify right. uh, exactly the target. So yeah, that's so uh, for those that are not used to switching Docker context, that's the it's just a Docker context command, right? And then I guess that the context for Docker desktop is the same one like on Mac and Windows. It's called Docker desktop, <laughs> so uh, it's consistent it's, there. Uh, it's called desktop dash Linux. Uh, so I, I think, think yeah, we have a desktop Windows as well, don't we? On the on desktop for Windows. Oh, okay, okay. For mine, on, on mine, it's always like Docker dash desktop, but. Of course, mine's so we should, we should double, double check that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, when we start Docker Desktop, uh, we set it to automatically switch the default, uh, the current context in use to switch it to this to Docker Desktop, uh, to Desktop Linux. So yeah, um, I love that feature what, too. By the way, like uh, the convenience of that, because I'm you know we've all got a bunch of different tools now and. Uh, being able to start it and know that it's kind of got me ready to go without having to go and configure a bunch of other things is nice too. So I love, I like that convenience yeah. of Docker desktop. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's just that I think that, uh, the, the contexts are not something that, uh, many users are aware of, of the functionality that they really, um, enable. So, um, Probably we would need actually to um, again to advertise them in a way that to make people aware that you have this context that allow you to target different platforms. Right. And uh, we we'll see now with uh, desktop for Linux, we get also the cloud capabilities uh, with the CLI, but and that is enabled uh, by the context types. So um, it's uh, I, I, to, there is a lot Docker of Con. <laughs> I think that's when we did that twenty twenty DockerCon. Uh, we'll bring up that there's video. There's a lot of there's a lot of functionality. I think that's hidden in uh, context, or uh, it's enabled by a context. And um, at least from a CLI usage perspective, I think there is really a huge problem of user discovering new functionality because there right. is no way if you add the new cli functionality there is kind of no way of informing people hey this is a really cool uh thing is right. it useful for you or it may solve some some problems for you but uh every so it's kind of hidden so um all new CLI functionality is hidden. <laughs> it's just the nature of CLI, and that's actually something that I talk about a lot uh, when I'm when I'm whether I'm consulting or whatever. Where it's like, okay, I'll ask people, when did you you know when did you last really learn Docker? And if they tell me it was before like 2018, then chances are there's a whole bunch of stuff they don't know about and they could be using. And I'll often just you know take that time to say, hey, did you know about Compose V2? Hey, did you know about that you could SSH in your context so you can control remote servers without ever having to set up the Docker TCP port or whatever? Like that was one of my favorite pull requests of all time, I think, in Docker was the ability to add a context for SSHing into a remote server, which just makes it so convenient. Um, uh, rather than what I see a lot of people doing, which is SSHing into a server, Git cloning a repo <laughs> and all this extra stuff. I'm like, you don't have to do all that. Um, but you're right, yeah, and maybe that's a feature request I need to add for the GUI is to like change and edit context from the GUI so that people can like you, you can actually do it from the dropdown. You can change your context, I think. No, you can only change your Kubernetes context. I don't have it running. Um, so now we're thinking up new ideas, and I'm getting distracted because now I'm going to have to go fill out a bunch of new ideas in the in the roadmap. But you all yeah, heard it. I'll, go to the roadmap, add some new stuff, add your ideas, <laughs> get some votes. Get some votes. I'll upload, I'll upload that one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're always looking for new ways to use the GUI and, um, which in this show is not about extensions, but that is another big thing that Docker's announced. Uh, I, we have not had a show on it yet, but everybody come to DockerCon. Uh, it's in less than a month. It's in like 20 some days, maybe 20 days. I think 
21 days. So everyone come to DockerCon. It's free. Sign up at DockerCon.com. Uh, I'll be there. We're all three going to be there talking, I'm sure. Uh, you all have been volunteered for lots of things, I imagine. And uh, I get a session on Node.js, which I'm slowly filling up or finishing up because I'm late. Um, so let's let's get into it. Uh, I know we've worked hard on preparing a demo beforehand, and we make sure we're, we're able to screen share in Linux and uh, make all the things work happily through the internet. And um, I think it, you know it's it's one of, it's one of those demos where it's like, yep, see, just like you thought. But uh, I think it's worth showing people kind of some of the stuff we you got to deal with on Linux. Um, it's not always drag and drop in the world of Linux. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen of my uh, Ubuntu machine. So in case there is some sort of failure. Oh, yeah, we lost your audio again. <laughs> so before the show, we, we had this fun challenge uh, where it seems like whenever Anka changed Windows or something, the audio was cut out. So we're just going to have to figure that out. Um, there you go. So yeah, you're back. You hear me? Yep. Okay, so you can hear me fine? Okay. Yep. Uh, I've shared my screen. Can you see? No. Yep. You see it. Okay, perfect. So, uh, I'm from the uh, page uh, for uh, the beta version. Uh, the same first one because I've already. But just to speed this up, because it may depend on the connection. And I'm going to install directly uh, Docker desktop on the Ubuntu machine. First, before uh, doing that, I'm just going to look for Docker to make sure I don't have anything. I have it installed. Uh, I should have, I think, installed Docker. I'm not sure of that. Um, Sorry, you're you're uh, cutting in and out a little bit, so we, we might have Dave describe what you're doing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, you, we can hear you. I'm not sure. Okay, so I'm basically what we need to do here. I've downloaded the pack, and I'm gonna run uh, up install and give it a package. Okay. So this will take a little bit of time. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to catch up because you were cutting out a little bit there. But I think so in the background, you have already set up the Docker re re repos for Debian. Yeah. And this is, this is I think this is technically on a Ubuntu machine, right? Um, and yeah. there's a, there's actually a chat question. Owen's talking about, you know, he's, he's using Slackware on non-systemd init scripts. Uh, <laughs> and I guess he's wondering if there's a way to, to hack it without having to have system D. Um, and then of course he's, yeah, he's like, I'm, I'm going to figure it out. So, uh, I don't know if you've all, you've all tried it without system D, but Owen's going to let us know. Oh, and Anka, you're, you're back to muted again. So I'm not sure how that keeps happening. I haven't tried it with system D, without system D myself, but I think if you just uh, run the binary as as a regular user, it should just work. I think all we use system D for really is just that auto start that Anka mentioned. So on login, um, we use system D, but that's it's just a, it's kind of optional. Is there um, is there a a service that runs in the background when you're not using Docker Desktop? No, no, it's entirely um, just a uh, a regular app, and it just happens to run. Uh, the KVM, QMU stuff on demand just to start the VM. So it's all all a regular, normal user space app. Nothing you know, nothing fancy, no system services. For things like uh, privileged ports where you need extra capabilities, we just um, bless the binary with that capability so that uh, whenever it's run, it, it has that, which oh, is okay. a nice thing. Because on, yeah. on Mac, we had to run a service for this. Right, yeah. And then on, I think on... Oh, I know over the years, this stuff has changed so much over the years. I know I've, I've seen lots of prompts, prompts and things and warnings and conflicts and all that stuff. So, okay. And we have the agrees or agreement. Sorry, we're narrating for you, Anka, because you're still, it still says you're muted. So we're just going <laughs> to, we're going to, we're going to walk, walk through this. Um, and extensions. 
Yeah, yes, it's all, it's all, yeah, these are all really, really good and exciting new things that you get with Docker Desktop that you wouldn't get if you just installed the engine. That's actually, I don't even know if that's in my version. I'm not sure I've even enabled the the beta or the extensions feature or whatever. How do we get, uh, is extensions just showing up now automatically for everyone? What is the, do you know what the status is on that? I think in the very latest builds, it's uh, enabled by default. Uh, but there's a feature flag, I think, for okay. earlier builds. Is that correct? I think, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's correct. Oops. She's going to have to use hand signs. Uh, from yeah, I know, I have to. <laughs> we're going to need to Sorry, use. Waving if I'm wrong. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, she's probably troubleshooting because I the, the the screen's not showing anymore. Um, let's see what else we got in questions. Charlie is mentioning that uh, the VM names. Oh, that's in WSL two. Okay, VM names. Yeah, like there's, there's there's no. Um... Uh, there's no sort of oh, no, no VM name really because we just run a QME process that just uses dev KVM. So it's just a, it's just a it's just a raw raw VM. So there's no like um, we don't use libvirt or anything. So you don't have to you wouldn't see anything if you used a, uh, another tool to list VMs or anything. You see processes. You can look at activity monitor or whatever, and you can PS and you can see it all there. But um, uh, yes, yeah, unlike on Windows where we have to give everything a name and then people can see them, and sometimes they uh, uninstall them by mistake, or yeah. So it's 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 yeah easier. We still it still shows you as muted. Anka says guest has muted themselves. It's such a weird quirk. Um, James is saying Sorry, in I chat. Don't know why it does oh, that. there you go. <laughs> You're back. Uh, yeah, just uh, I I know I just shared my screen to uh, answer the questions that you that were asked. So concerning the um, system the integration, we are using actually also something called Deb Helper that should set up the service uh, on non system D. But again, we need to test that a little bit. <laughs> So cool. you should, I mean, everybody can give it a try, can test it and see if there are any issues. We can try to uh, go and see if we can get a fix for them. So uh, that, and I don't remember what was the last question. Um, okay, I can't hear you anymore. Okay, I'll share again my screen, and maybe uh, Dave, you can talk through it, <laughs> or because sure. Um, let's see. I can hear you well, but uh, not. I can't hear you, Brett, anymore. So, um, one of the other questions was. Oh, and James is pointing out. Uh, I didn't realize that. This is a busy week. Uh, Node.js had a major release this week. Eighteen just came out with Node.js uh, like Tuesday. Uh, I was waiting on the Ubuntu uh, Jammy to go to be official because this is kind of the month they normally do it. And so James is mentioning that uh, Jammy Jellyfish just released today. So now we have uh, Ubuntu 2204. Uh, I guess he's asking uh, how closely do we work with the distros and their roadmap? Do we, does this Have you tried this on Jammy? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you back? OK, perfect. Yes, okay. yes, uh, probably. Yeah, I think it switched mics on you, but that's totally fine. Like, uh, yeah, we'll clean okay. it up in yes, post, we, as they say. <laughs> so. uh, we've tested it on the latest version of Ubuntu 2204. Uh, I think we had a few users uh, that uh, raised some issues on the roadmap that uh, it wasn't working. So we uh, we found out why uh, we fixed it, and hopefully uh, the current package that we have in the on the beta page uh, it should run on um, uh, on the latest version. So in case you have any issue, uh, any issues, you can. There is um, GitHub repository that we dedicated uh, for uh, the desktop, uh, desktop for Linux uh, for issues. So you can raise the issue there, and we'll try to uh, have a look at it as soon as possible. Okay, so that was actually a question. So for people that are testing this, and if they have issues, they go to the to the roadmap issue, or where do they where do they put this? 
uh, we would prefer the uh, there is something called a repository called uh, github.com slash docker slash desktop dash Linux. Okay, so this so, is actually matching the other ones, right? Because well, there is a there's a I Mac OS and a Windows one for I Docker have, Desktop. So uh, this is the one. If I'm sharing already. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So basically, you, you go there and uh, just raise the issue. We still have we have a few users that uh, are testing it and raising uh, and uh, raising an issue for whatever uh, they find that doesn't work. So we are going to watch uh, this repository. Uh, um, I put so, that link into chat for everyone. So um, go check that out. Another question, by the way, uh, I'm just going to do some rapid fire questions because we got some people backed up with questions. Um, how do they tune? Uh, I don't know if you're finished installing it, but how do you tune VM parameters such as RAM? Uh, well, as we do on Mac and Windows. <laughs> I mean, through settings. Uh, okay, so I uh, yeah, uh, so basically I showed. Let me go back to this. So we started uh, Docker Desktop. You see the dashboard; it's very similar to um, what we have on Mac and Windows. Also, yeah, the um, previous questions uh, question were related to the extensions. When do we get this? Uh, I think I don't know in if in the latest version of Docker Desktop these are enabled by default. They may be. We would need to check, but uh, currently I'm using uh, Dev Build, so we have everything um, by default uh, enabled. So it's something that will come up uh, in the following weeks. So this is why uh, here you'll see uh, the extensions. Uh, so All right. okay, so we've launched uh, Docker Desktop for Linux. The dashboard is identical, well, should be identical to the one on Mac and Windows. We have the Wave menu that, again, should have exactly the same uh, functionality. So if you want to tune the VM parameters, you go to a normal to the settings uh, panel. You have the resources uh, tab. And here you see um, the number of CPUs you can try to give it let's say okay maybe a bit more okay let's see so um basically i'm changing the configuration of the vm that will actually reboot the vm uh, so uh, basically now we need to we go again uh, to the restart uh, cycle so we need to wait uh, for the engine to uh, be up and running again all right, while we're waiting there, um, Kamajaru has a question. Uh, so K Kubernetes works the same way here as it does on uh, Mac and Windows? Uh, yes, it's identical. I mean, uh, the main goal of Docker Test for Linux was to give it the, an identical experience as on Mac and Windows, the same ease of use. So for example, for Kubernetes, I can go to the Kubernetes tab. Uh, by default, I don't have it enabled, but I can just go click on this, apply and restart again. Of course, this will may take a little bit of time because we need to download the components of Kubernetes and to launch the services. But all the users have to do here is just check a box, click a button and grab a coffee. <laughs> well, not, not you don't have time to grab a coffee, but uh, <laughs> it takes a few seconds. Yeah, all depends on your resources and your internet. Yeah, so that- uh, Your internet connection. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I always notice I always know after I know that I have Kubernetes installed because I whenever I'm doing Docker images I was seeing all those images and I'm like why are these here yeah. oh yeah that's right I have Kubernetes running um, yeah so okay other questions while we're uh, waiting on that to install so uh, ARM sixty four support what's the store the story there uh, sorry you know, ARM sixty four uh, support for Docker Docker desktop for Linux is is that a plan? Um, I, well, I, th I think the, the devs are currently Intel, aren't they? Is that right? Uh, we I are think... testing some things. I'm not yeah. sure. Um... Yeah, I think it builds, it builds okay. It's just we haven't yet 
we haven't got concrete plans just yet. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have plans yet. It's just that uh, even as for testing, we don't have really development uh, arm machines that uh, that we can use. Uh, just I mean, as a replacement for our normal. Uh, right. You have. Yeah, I guess so, you're gonna need to buy the whole team a Raspberry Pi and uh, with with the, the the ones with the sixty. Or that was it, sixteen or thirty-two gig of RAM or whatever you can get them now. <laughs> I have one in the closet, but it's I, I'm not sure how well it's going to do running Docker Desktop. Um, it's not quite. It's a not a Raspberry Pi that's really great. But uh, you know, I hear that Microsoft laptops are going to come with new hot Snapdragons and some sometime in the future that are going to be faster than the current ones because I think that's one of the problems. I'm not a Windows ARM expert, but um, you know, we're going to have to wait on somebody other than apple to make a really awesome arm processor i think before we'll see an uptick in that i'm voting I, for it I, I want i want the windows world and the linux world to have the same awesomeness that i'm having on this m1 next to me where it has no fan noise and it lasts all day and it's pretty fantastic yeah and all, all the images are multi-arch already everything's arm 64 underneath uh, as you know multi-arch um yeah so i think we're pretty well you know positioned prepared. yeah as, 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 soon as, as soon as the hardware is available we can all get these lovely windows machines and uh, we'll be on it yeah, in fact, when we if, we if we just go down that rabbit hole for a second, um, so thanks, Max, for the question, and Anton for the question. They both asked about uh, ARM support, and uh, like my favorite Docker, de my favorite Linux desktop is Mint Cinnamon, and they don't have an ARM variant right now. At least last time I checked, like a month ago. So you know, there's still obviously there are ARM Linux desktops that exist, but it's one of those things where I think the whole community has kind of got to work. We were, I feel like we're all waiting on really great hardware. And then once we get that really great hardware, the demand will be there and then everyone will want to work on it. Cause I'm the one of the ones, I'm one of those many people that are like in the, in the GitHub repos for all these tools in the, in the, I'm just like pasting into the issues. Uh, where's arm support? Where's arm support? <laughs> Add arm support. Um, and I'm not smart enough to actually do the PRs and all these tools, but there's a lot out there that I feel like we're still missing uh, arm support for. So it's, it's, uh, and I, and I know like you all are using like on the back end. there's all this, every, every Docker tool I know of works on arm. So it's just a question of getting some of the requirements there, like good hardware. So we'll see. I'm hoping yeah. I'm going to put that in the issues. <laughs> That's another issue. Everybody I'm, next week is going to be an upvoting issue week. We're just going to have all the GitHub issues that in the roadmap that I've created that I have not seen done. And I'm selfish. Like I want the drop down button to disable Kubernetes without having to go into settings. That's something I really want. I want to be able to turn on and off. We have the pause now, which is great. I, I use the pause daily. Pause is my favorite new feature. I'm assuming pause is in the Linux version as well. Should be. Yeah, yeah, Let's. Uh, we can try it. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Kubernetes uh, has finished while we're yeah. talking. So and and I didn't know this. I didn't know this, but the way I was asking in the in the Slack chat, uh, it's it, evidently the pause feature uses something with namespaces. Like it actually, it actually uses Linux functionality. And I was always thinking it was something, you know, something built into Docker itself into the actual binary. But it sounds like it's more about Linux itself. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a lower level tool. It uses uh, C groups and the uh, C group freezer. So it um it, it it's a bit complete oh, C to get okay. yeah to, to get everything to be uh, to be quiet and to not uh, burn CPU. Everything is moved into the freezer and then it's defrosted again when uh, when you unpause. That's that's a great analogy. I like that uh, the freezer. Yeah. So um, I just did a context ls just to show that. The current context in use, it's called desktop Linux. It means you are targeting a uh, Docker desktop with all the CLI commands you are running in, uh, in the terminal. If you want, of course, if you are running the Docker engine in parallel, you'll have the default context that points to it. So if you want to use your local engine, you'll have to, to either do a Docker context use default and then run the Docker CLI commands that will target uh, the local engine. Or when we're, you're running the Docker uh, command line, you can specify the context uh, with uh, dash C via parameter. So if I do this, it will target my local uh, engine, which I don't have it installed, so you'll get that error. So okay. if I do this, 
desktop Linux uh, here explicitly, uh, I will get my VM, which responds. So that's so, pretty cool that you can, um, I mean, you mentioned that earlier, but to see it and to think about it, like to be able to choose which engine I'm running in each command and to, I don't, I'm not sure why I would switch back and forth, but you know, maybe <laughs> like once I have Docker desktop, I'm not sure why I would care about running on the host. Maybe it's in certain cases it might be faster, but, um, we're doing, and you're doing the same bind mount, right? Stuff here. So it's yeah. bind mounting across the VM. Um, I'm a Mac person, so I'm very passionate about the work that you all are doing so much on the virtual file system drivers and all the stuff for Mac that's making it faster across that OS boundary. Because that's, I think that's like one private, to me, that seems like one of the hardest challenges for you all besides networking is getting the file performance across different OSs to act native. What is that like in Linux? Is that better on Linux, like Docker in Linux on Linux? Is that a, is that an easier time for you? We are using the same technology with FS to share um, files between uh, with the VM. So, um, so far from our tests, from our benchmarks, uh, it's much faster than, uh, well, in general for me, the Linux machines are much faster when compiling stuff uh, than uh, on Mac and Windows. So, okay. From the test, it's indeed it's, it's much faster. It okay. has a, a very small. Well, we try to compare uh, with the local engine because that's kind of um, the reference point right. <laughs> for us. So we are trying to improve uh, the performance of uh, Docker Desktop, and we really here we are looking at the performance of, of the local engine, and we are trying to achieve that one. Uh, so far. Uh, the let's say the the impact is very small the, the one that we noticed from our tests but we haven't tested it w with um, that many um, software stacks so maybe it depends on the software stack whatever they are uh, exercising we may find ways uh, it may be slower in some cases we can look at those cases and understand why and improve um, I'm trying, I'm so looking through the, I'm looking through the roadmap issue, uh, for this. Cause there's so many comments. <laughs> there's so many people talking about this in that one thread. And, uh, I was one, I'm, I'm guessing that somebody's doing, it seems like with me on the roadmap issues, like the, the minute there's a change in anything with the performance stuff on any of the OSs, there's, uh, a, a dozen people that show up eventually like within a week or something that are all doing benchmarking to say on my project, I get this many seconds. And on my, you know, cause I know that's happening a lot right now on Mac. I tend to follow a lot of these roadmap issues cause I'm, you know, I, I support people using Docker desktop. I use Docker desktop and I really care about that stuff. And, um, it, it, I know it's happening a lot on the Mac side. So I'm guessing there's already people in there on the uh, Linux side saying, so for those of you watching, help them out, take your project, do the performance comparison, give them stats so they can understand what they're dealing with. And, you know, uh, lots of different software has different size of side effects of running in multiple OSs or across the OS boundary. So, yeah, so I, I think that uh, these users are, uh, I see them as like our favorite users because they are <laughs> helping us uh, really to cover many different uh, corner cases. So they are really great. And we are grateful for all the feedback that we'll, we'll get like that. Um, yeah. Conrad's so, pointing out, by the way, that I am wrong. That uh, <laughs> that on on Mac as well, the contexts are default and desktop Linux, and I and I I did just check that, and I do ex exactly see the same thing. So um, I am again outdated and based on old information. So um, cool that we ha yeah. So again, it's more consistency. Um, I guess the, the, is the plan like when you're now when you're releasing new versions like what we, was it three point seven that just came out. Is that the latest? Four. Oh, 4.7. 4. 4. 4.7. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I remember it was a 7. Uh, so when that came out, that's going to be, the, the release cycle is going to be in parity with all three of them, I, I guess, at this point, or that's yeah. your goal? Yeah. Uh, it is easier to, to manage from our side to have the same version uh, for all three. Yeah. Donald is asking, is there anything special about running both versions on Linux or I guess maybe 
he's asking why. <laughs> it once you, that's my question too. Once you had Docker Desktop, why would you still run it natively? If uh... oh, because we can sometimes. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sorry. There could be a there could be sorry. There could be a niche thing like if you had a particular hardware device uh, that you wanted to map into your container, and that maybe wouldn't work with the VM, and so it would be it would just work with the native engine. So there might be the odd niche. Yeah, I do. I do see those feature requests from Mac as well sometimes, where they people want to mount in hardware, um, and so that's like an that's a sort of an argument for getting a Linux machine and just doing it on the, the bare metal host. Um, cool. Um, all right. Any other? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for more questions, but while I'm doing that, is there any other demos we want to do? Sorry, I kind of cut you off in your demo there. Yeah, no problem. I'm asking you, Anka. Do you have any more? Do you have um, any more um, stuff you want to well, show we off? Can, we <laughs> can we can go and try several functionalities. Um, well, um, okay. But keep in mind, please, that this is a development version. It's not yet. <laughs> sure. Uh, we'll we'll go with it until it breaks or everything works fine. We went through all the functionalities. <laughs> so uh, basically, the same thing as Dave mentioned. I think earlier we can do um, so. We can run. Just one moment. Uh, I have. Already, I don't know if my internet connection is off. That could be a bug, actually. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, looking at it. That's the okay. internal address, of the HTTP proxy. Okay, then we we'll go to something else. Um, what uh, we can check out extensions, maybe. So the extensions, uh, we have a list of them. I think the really useful ones are the ones on the disk usage, for example. No, I'm, are you sure I don't have a internet? Uh, no, it's not an internet connection. Yeah, while you're looking at that. Okay, it's um, weird. Yeah, Donald's mentioning that he also, uh, had a networking issue where it could not see external programs on host or the internet. So that's, uh, I don't think that's normal. <laughs> that's not the intention of Docker desktop on Linux to prevent internet access for the containers. So uh, if you are having that issue, it sounds like you file a bug report. So when people file bug reports on Linux, it's the same process, right? Like they can go through the menu and they can get the, the troubleshooting GUID, I think is what it is, right? And then they put that in their support request or their github issue yeah that's right it's perfect and then that will include the logs we can look at the logs and it'll hopefully be straightforward to spot what the problem is i think i, I think uh, since it's not quite released yet there'll be a few glitches and um, i'm not totally shocked that there's a network glitch but it'll obviously be, you know, it'll, be <laughs> it'll be fixed pretty soon <laughs> i'm sure just after the show we'll have it uh, completely fixed again yeah um well that's why we do this on the internet early so when when the when the beta when the beta comes off the product, that it's not broken. <laughs> so yeah. perfect. it's working again. Okay. So yeah, there we go. I give it a restart. A restart always fixes <laughs> some some things. Uh, okay. So exactly as uh, the idea is that you could you can use it the same way as you use the local uh, Docker engine. The same commands should work. You can buy mounts or you can map ports, and they should be available. Now. In the dashboard, we can see, uh, yeah, if I go and open in browser, I should have my tutorial, yeah, running on localhost. So it's exactly the same experience as with uh, the other versions for uh, Windows and Mac. So what else? Okay, we've launched container. I'm just going to get rid of it here. Uh, what else? Uh, volumes. We can create volumes. I think, uh, yeah, we can explore the content of the volume, but uh, as I created it, I have no data in it. But the same if you run Docker Compose and it will create the volumes, place the uh, right data to it, you can actually uh, inspect uh, it here. 
Um, some really nice functionalities also dev environments. Um, basically, the main idea with dev environments is to containerize the entire uh, all your dependencies and all the, the way you develop your application. So everything runs in a container. You in that container you have your source code, you have your dependencies, and everything you need to uh, build your uh, your code, your application. And at any point in time, you can basically send, you can share that instance with um, colleagues or um, with other users that would like to see the current state of your application. So it's quite a, a nice uh, nice feature, especially if you don't want to pollute your, uh, your host with uh, installing, uh, I don't know what, uh, libraries, uh, specific versions, and so on. Like that, everything is containerized. Uh, you can change versions for uh, for the software without uh, having to worry about uh, corrupting your uh, host OS. Yeah, I, so, we haven't talked a lot about dev environments on the show yet, and um, it's funny because I'm actually watching you go through it and realizing that this GUI has changed at least since when I last tried it, or that my memory is failing again. Uh, because uh, I think the dev environments is an interesting workflow change for teams that are having to deal with you know stashing their changes switching branches someone else pushing an unfinished uh branch that they have to jump to and um I, i'm i'm becoming a fan of the gh command line because it actually lets me check out pull requests without a whole lot of effort uh, which was always a pain before but this is an interesting option for that workflow where you can leave your stuff alone not have to go and reclone someone else's version of the app on a different location you can just pull it down and let sort of Docker take care of it for you. Um, we probably need to have a show just to talk about dev environments in the future of that, because I know that there's there's a lot of ideas about where that's going to go. So I leave it running in the background until it, uh, it will finish by that time. OK, we've installed Kubernetes. I wanted just to uh, run my, I always keep the same application, application that I use to uh, demo. Sorry, it's actually easy to test. Oh. Um, Cube. So I have a cube YAML. Um, I don't check it always because it's. Uh, I prefer the compose. <laughs> right. The way we display applications with compose, but it's using basically the same Docker uh, Docker image, the tutorial that we've launched uh, before. So it's just running it as uh, a service, cube service. So. I'm going to try to, so if you, we do here kubectl uh, get services just to see that it works. So we have the control plane answers. So I think it's kubectl apply uh, or should we pass the dash F before? Yeah. I, I'm never no, sure it's about after. this. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's after apply. apply ah, okay. Cube control apply dash F, yeah. Okay, so if I do this, okay, so I do the again kubectl get services. And I see my the load balancer thing. It's mapped mm -hmm. to my local host at port 80. So if I go to port 80, um, host, I see again my the same tutorial service, but now it's running as a cube application. So the idea was with all, also with the cube installation was to give. Um, developers an easy way just to focus, focus on your application, developing it, creating your uh, images, and then just deploy it without having to worry about how do I set up uh, my cube cluster? How do I uh, forward my uh, service uh, ports to my local host to be able to access them easily? So this is really facilitating that uh, just focus on development. Yeah. Um, and Okay, so what's the next OS? Free BSD? <laughs> I have someone in chat, I think, asking about free BSD or any BSD. Oh, okay. uh, so we got BSD fans hanging out. I used to use free BSD as well. I, I have fond memories. Yeah, Anton was asking any plans on Docker for BSD. That's a com that's been a question for years about a free BSD or um, what is it, NetBSD or something like that. There's a couple other ones. Uh, for building Docker engine uh, for those. And I think that there are unofficial image 
image or builds, but I don't know that Docker has one, right? I, I don't think Docker has yeah, an official BSD. No, nothing, nothing official, I don't think. Yeah. And Robot Glock has a question about dev environments. Uh, is there anything required to spin up a dev environment other than the Docker files and code? Ah, actually, uh, because I uh, this is my test machine, so I did this before. When you try to start a dev environment, uh, you you will see the what are the requirements there. It will try to detect if you have Git installed, um, and there is also the integration with uh, VS Code, and it will check that you have VS Code installed, and there is some other uh, VS Code uh, extension that needs to be installed. But everything is very it's a very guided um, installation, so. Uh, I mean, you will see there if there is right. any dependency that is missing, and you will uh, you'll be provided with. I think it's a direct link to where you can set it up to how to set it up quickly. Right. So it's just a matter of a few seconds to have this up and running. Yeah. So you can open, for example, I'm going to open with uh, VS Code, uh, the dev environment that I've just launched. Uh, so. The one that I launched, uh, I think it was already the single container dev environment that has the, the fields are already pre-filled with um, uh, references to a Go uh, project. So that's a very quick uh, demo. So you can see here, it's uh, it's actually displaying the codes, everything, and this is all inside the container. And uh, here, all the command line, if you open the terminal, it will be you're running inside the container where you should have all the dependencies to uh, run this, uh, change something, build, and uh, run it. So, um, yeah, it's quite useful. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I definitely need to spend some time on extensions, which is just like, it's it, that's, that's a brand new thing. And then dev environments, I think I need to take a second look because it sounds yeah. like the, the tutorial, that stuff that is a uh, new to me. So having more guided uh, experience is pretty cool for the, the dev environments. Yeah, uh, we can try again the extensions. So yeah, now no, that so the um, disk usage and the extended logs. This is okay. So it's successful. Uh, uh, these are uh, kind of the, the internal uh, extensions that offer some additional functionality. Uh, you have some other. Uh, extensions i haven't checked them uh, all of them out i think this one this one was really nice too it actually allows you to scan images so you don't need accounts or anything else okay so uh, it's installed so once you uh, basically you can install whatever uh, extensions uh, you find useful and yeah and test them and then you would uh, get basically you'd get all the extensions that you installed in uh, the sidebar. So if we go now to the disk usage, we can see actually some um, yeah the the space that images are taking in um, inside the VM containers and so on. So you can see how the actual uh, disk is being used. Yeah, you can cool. also delete some stuff and so on. I didn't know about the logs uh, one, the extended uh, the logs. The logs one. So basically here we have, use, we see, uh, it will show all the containers we are running. We can, um, I think we can filter logs, but I don't know exactly what are the regex that <laughs> we can run here. I don't know. Um, yeah. Log. I have no idea. But uh, the idea is that we should be able to easily filter logs here. We just write. Right. See everything. So Conrad is thumbs upping the portainer extension, which I didn't know that existed yet. Ah. So it sounds like everybody's getting on the extension bandwagon pretty quick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's like there's a much longer list there than the last time I checked. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Can, I haven't tried it yet, so don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um, uh, there's also uh, slim slim ai there sneak is there um i think the octeto i think i'm not sure if we've done an octeto show um but they've these are all people that i've talked to but i'm not sure if we've actually had their stuff on the show so yeah there's a uh Euphysia's in there wow there's a there's pretty cool that's neat meshry is in there from the layer five team it was like it was like at least three of i think 
at least three of those extensions are have Docker captains that are uh, involved with that. So that's probably maybe how some of these how these extensions get is the community leaders are like, hey, let's uh, let's let's put our cool stuff in the in the extension store, which is great because this is very much following the model of Visual Studio Code uh, extensions of uh, we give you the framework and you add your extensions. So yeah, oh yeah, look at there. Yeah, so we're just basically putting their web UI mm -hmm. in uh, in the the UI there, so, so I don't have to run it as a web yeah. interface. That's I pretty neat. Do this like that. <laughs> yeah, we just had Portainer on the show. I don't know, a month and a half ago, two months ago, and uh, I was quite surprised by how um, how much that product has matured and how many things it can do now. M managing Docker, Swarm, and Kubernetes all within the same same tool. So it's uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, so I guess uh, this uh, this these are the extensions. I'm not sure if they are by default enabled uh, with the latest version of uh, desktop we need, or for Mac and Windows. We need to check that out. Um, I think before you've asked something about pause, uh, pause resume. Yeah. So basically, for pausing, you can, let's say, maybe you're running some, uh, some CPU intensive workloads and you just want to take a break, do something else, and you need to stop it or, well, put it on break you can just go here set it to pause um well you can't really use the dashboard anymore as everything uh, is uh, frozen um so how do we from here how do we unfreeze well we can either do the resume from here from here or uh, what uh, i prefer very much is simply run a docker ps or a docker command that will automatically oh. bring it back i don't think i knew so, that I, I don't think i knew that if you just used a command it would automatically unfreeze that's cool yeah so I, that was I, most. oh i'm sorry i was gonna say i vote for a, a a moby icon that looks frozen i don't know how you would do that and uh <laughs> In a in a two a monochrome look, but uh, I we I think we need an ice cube around around him or something uh, to indicate that you're resuming or that you need to resume. I'm not sure. We don't have that on Mac or Windows yet. I haven't checked exactly yeah. this scenario. So I'm if you to... have it there, maybe that we need to bring it uh, to Linux and <laughs> check it out. Yeah, I think so... does it, I don't remember if it changes the icon or not. Actually. Um... Oh, actually, there might be a, a two stripes, you know, like a pause button on a on a cassette okay. player. I think it might be that. Uh, comes in. Okay, then another bug <laughs> to fix. <laughs> I have to. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna check after the show. Um, <laughs> don't want to start Docker right in the middle of live streaming. Um, probably just fine um, on my M1 though. But on my old Intel, uh, doing anything when you're live streaming on an old Intel Mac is like dangerous because it's working so hard. It sounds like a jet engine, just to stream. <laughs> Another thing that I think it's important just to mention, uh, so uh, before we were talking about uh, Compose V2. So uh, you may know that on Linux, you need basically you need to install it yourself uh, and if you really want to use the latest version. So for desktop, uh, we are going to ship uh, only Compose V2. And we are basically enabling some uh, setting that will allow you to easily integrate with V1. And by that, we mean you can, if you want Compose V2 to act like the Compose V1, in mm -hmm. the sense that if you want to call it Docker dash Compose instead of Docker space Compose, you can just go in the settings panel, do this, enable, apply and restart. So what it will do here, it will uh, create a sim link called Docker dash Compose that will point to uh, the uh, to V2. Mm. So whenever you run uh, Docker dash compose, it will call actually V2. So you can enable this here. Uh, to create a sim link, you need to uh, uh, access. So I'm gonna. Yeah, that's actually a good tip because there's probably a lot of other tools and IDEs that expect the dash if they haven't updated themselves yeah. the last year. And that might be a reason for people to enable that on Linux. So if I go here, I'm just going to run a version commander to show that it's actually uh, Compose V2. Yeah. So if I disable this, I'll, again, my password, and I run the same command, we can't find it anymore. Right. So uh, you see that it 
is actually creating it in a location. I think that by default, V1 is going to be placed under user bin Docker dash compose. So uh, we are placing the, the sim link in user local bin. That should override uh, the user bin one. So even if you have compose okay. V1 installed, if we create a sim link, this should override uh, that uh, version. Right, so you can have it, so, you can have both, and not and ha not have it overwrite your your Python yeah. Docker Compose V1. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So, uh, it's a pretty elegant way to make sure you're not just screwing up everyone's doc. Because I mean, if if people are on Docker, if people are on Linux desktop today, I guess I'm saying th they probably are running Docker and Compose already. They've learned their process. They might install Compose with pip. They might, you know, they're probably using the Docker. Uh, app packages to install Docker, so so it's uh, um, it's an assumption I'm sure that you the, the team is making that you're you you're already going to be installing it on top of an existing Docker, and um, that's what like Donald's talking about some of his issues. But I think that's that's a bug related to possibly uh, something in Docker Desktop. But it's intended clearly intended that they're both supposed to run at the same time or able to run at the same time. Um, so just to, to wrap up for everyone, this is Docker Desktop for Linux. This is can run in parallel with any Docker Linux you're already using, and it all runs in a VM so that you can use the Docker context commands to switch back and forth, and it gives you all the features that you get in Mac and Windows now. So, I think it's gonna like all the all of the wishes are now for Linux are now complete, and we get to all move on to something else and watch what what cool thing Docker will make next. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is, by the way, in chat, this is the chance for you to ask those last minute questions because we're going to start to wrap up. But um, the the way to get a hold, I'm just going to remind people the way you're saying, if they want to try this out, they get that in the Docker docs. And then that link is in the chat as well as below. And then if they want to get support or they want to file a potential bug, they're going to go to a different repo than the, than the roadmap that I keep talking about. That's It's actually a desktop dash Linux repo. So I'm going to put that again in chat for those that are maybe just joining. And if you didn't know for Docker desktop, there is an actual GitHub repo for each one of them, Mac, Windows, and now Linux that has, that's where you can file bug issues, um, not feature requests, but bugs <laughs> in those repos. And, but, and if you want a feature, you go to the roadmap. Did, did I say all that correctly? Is that I think okay. so. That sounded good to me. I passed the test. Great. <laughs> I almost know what I'm talking about. Um, so we did have a couple of last equipment questions. Uh, yeah, I think Conrad uh, repeated it. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, are dev or beta build channels coming back to Docker Desktop? Or like, what is the beta? What is beta in Docker Desktop mean? Or is that even a thing? Yeah, we, we the features have um, different labels. Sometimes it's experimental, like on the Mac, the Red IOFS is labeled experimental, and that just it's about that particular feature. The whole application is stable, but that particular feature is labeled as uh, temp as temporarily unstable. Uh, so these beta features are just kind of um, they're just early in the cycle. So we're still we're still adding things to them, and it's a really good time to provide extra feedback, and you know. Also, also highlighting that's new. You see the beta label, and you go, "Ah, oh, that's a new thing. Let me try that and see if it works." And then give us some feedback, and we can still make quite big changes to it because it hasn't quite, we haven't labeled it as fully GA yet. That feature. Okay. And so when you talk about like, let's imagine a feature, or we talk about extensions, or whatever these some of these beta things that might be there now. Uh, I know, like for on Mac, we have the virtual virtual FS or whatever it's called. That's a feature. Are these all in the settings under experimental? Is that how people? get the beta essentially they're going into the experimental settings i think i think some of the these beta ones are just uh, labeled as beta in the main ui rather than okay. sort of putting them in a separate section we've we want to make them more discoverable uh to make sure that people actually like know what's coming and can try them so we've put them at front and center in the main ui and just put the label saying beta right so uh there is technically not a beta download of Docker no. Desktop in general. It just so happens that right now, Docker Desktop for Linux is in beta, but it doesn't mean that they need to like switch to a stable channel later. Because some of these people are probably remembering the Edge days. We had Edge. <laughs> yes, yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> yeah, so that, um, yeah, uh, Linux is in beta, but uh, I imagine it will just upgrade nicely to the G8 version when we publish those devs in the in the repo. Okay. 
Uh, another question was, uh, how easy is it to get into the developer preview program? Um, let's talk about that for a minute. Isn't it? Is it the Docker desktop preview? Pro I'm trying to remember what is the what is the Docker community program for stuff. I think yeah, I think that I think that's it. I think asking on community Slack is probably the uh, the way in there. I think I think there's a I think there's a channel on community Slack. I would ask in the hash general, and um, hopefully uh, we can see that message and uh, hook up the right person. Yeah. Okay. There. There. We, I think that's what this, this is. What they're talking about. Not technically exactly related to Docker Desktop, but the developer preview program. And that's James got it right. Uh, I was forgetting what it was called. I. I am in there just because captains get in there. I think, but um, it looks like there's a button on oh, the website, so which yeah, Perfect. which takes you to a Google form. Um, yeah. Our mission is to be developer obsessed. Yeah, so there's a nice little blurb there. I, I don't, so I, I don't know if you all see these requests or if you're involved with these at all. But um, it's, yeah, you get into a Slack chat, essentially a, a private Slack room that you can provide feedback and be a little bit more, have a little bit more access inside of Docker if you want to fill out that form. But I guess the answer is we, none of are you neither one of you involved with that, so they don't you don't really have the answer to that. Uh, there is a desktop Linux dedicated channel on the community Slack. Uh, docker-desktop-linux. Um, so they can go there as well. So yeah, I and it's public. It's a public one. And just so everybody knows, uh, if they're not in the Docker Slack, I'm going to see if I can find it. It's under, yeah, I'm going to put this link in there as well. Um, oops, I don't I <laughs> I just minimized myself. I'm so tiny. I have no idea how I did that. Brett has gone tiny. <laughs> this is what happens when I do stuff live. There I am. Okay. Uh, putting this in the chat. So we have the community program that allows you to get into Slack. So. For those that want to get more involved, you got the GitHub repos. You got this Docker community Slack that you should sign up for. That's totally free. And then once you get in there, there is the Docker Desktop Linux channel that you can join. And then if you want to even go a, next, a step farther and join the developer preview program <laughs> that uh, g gets you sort of a little bit of insider access to the Docker team and all the con uh, the products. And they basically, uh, every once in a while, they'll do like a survey or uh, ask for feedback on stuff. So that's another way to get deeper into the community before you decide to start your own meetup and become one of the community leaders, which you can also do. And they're, uh, I know they're working on that program now because they, they keep talking to us in there. So if you want to start a meetup, that's another way to get involved. Um, and then come to DockerCon. I feel like I'm I'm playing Docker marketing today, so why not? DockerCon.com <laughs> um, takes you to the DockerCon sign-up page. Go over there. You can see the, you can register, you can, uh, I've already signed, registered, but not on this browser. Uh, you can look at, look at all these wonderful people speaking, including Eric, which I don't know if he's still hanging out in chat. Maybe he's still here. Uh, but Eric is also speaking from Sneak and I'm sure talking about something security. We've got all these other great people. I'm going to be talking there. That's in just, uh, I don't know, three, three, three weeks or two weeks. I'm not even paying attention right now. It's not very long and it's actually going to be two days. They're going to have a workshop day and then uh, so in case you want to learn stuff, there's a free workshop day at the beginning. And then there's a bunch of talks on the main day, the main DuckerCon day. So come and join us and we will all be there. Well, thank you to both of you so much for being here. And I look forward to seeing, I'll see you at DuckerCon. Um, and we'll all be in the chat there supporting. And so you all can come watch our videos and then we'll answer questions. And of course, we'll be here live next week as usual. Uh, next week, let's see who's on the list. Um... Oh, Rosemary Wang is going to be here. She's the author of Patterns and Practices for Infrastructure as Code. So we're going to be talking more about IOC and um, and all the fun stuff there and talk about her book. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anka. Thanks, Dave, for being here. See you all next Thank week. You. Ciao. Bye. Bye.